Pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's event. Um, in case we haven't heard my name, my name is Oliver Hartwig. I'm the Executive Director of the New Zealand Initiative. And tonight's event is the first event with our new Head of Research, Dr. Eric Crampton, who is here with us tonight. He's been with us for a little bit more than a month. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on Eric. Um, we've been working on him to recruit him to the initiative <laughs> for a bit more than a year. And when I first approached Eric, because I knew he's a very good economist, um, the first question was not what is this job all about or how much are you going to pay or anything. The question was, um, what's your earthquake rating? <laughs> <laughs> I should look that up for the office building. Um, and if I tell you Eric's background, um, it becomes immediately clear why he asked that question, because um, uh, he may not quite sound like a Cantabrian, because he's originally from Canada, but he spent the last 11 years at the University of Canterbury, and therefore he lived through the traumatic experiences, of course, of the um, Canterbury earthquakes. And so when I asked Eric what he wanted to give his first talk to the initiative on, um, the answer was, of course, on earthquakes. Now, you probably wouldn't quite get this um, looking at the title of this talk, but you've come to the right event after all. Non-ductile regulations and embedded fragility may sound a bit something like for the engineers among you, um, but it's actually a talk about um, not just how bad earthquakes are, but how um, much worse they can be made through the wrong policies. And Eric is very keen uh, that we all learn the lessons from the Canterbury earthquakes, because should there ever be one, a big one, in Wellington, Eric hopes that we can avoid um, some of the things that really made it a lot worse to clean up the mess left behind by the earthquake. And with that introduction, I'll just hand you over to Eric Crampton, and he will tell us everything that Canterbury did wrong and everything that Wellington should get right. <laughs> thanks, Oliver, and thanks for coming out to hear me on this. Um, Non-ductile regulations and embedded fragility. We've got an engineering school at the University of Canterbury. It's meant to be one of the better ones in the world. And they do worry about non-ductile structures. So that means a structure that when hit with a kind of a shearing force, it's going to thump. The, the pillars are going to break, and it's going to collapse, and everybody's going to die. And that's terrible. Um, I worry that we have non-ductile regulations, that we embed fragility into how our cities work, how our developers are able to build, and well, how we protect our heritage buildings by our sets of regulations. And when we are hit with a shock, like an earthquake, it's killer. It isn't just the deaths that happen, it's the aftermath where you can't get houses up in any kind of reasonable fashion because we have set the regulations in such a way that we cannot. And councils do not move quickly after an event to fix these kinds of fragilities as I'll go through in Christchurch. Um, I'll spend about the first third of the talk just walking through the Christchurch experience, talking a little bit about how Christchurch was before the earthquakes, and then going through the earthquake experience, setting the scene. After that, we'll go through the February earthquake. I had a chat with Richard Bentley the other day, and he was saying that he hadn't really actually heard from anybody who had been in the more strongly affected areas before. Uh, I think that it's important for us to have some understanding of what it can be like going through some of this, uh, and especially the aftermath where it's the regulation that messes everything up. Then I'll talk about how we planned against the rebuild, how the plans that were established both by council and then by CRSCCDU stymied the, the rebuild and prevented anybody from doing anything. We made the best the enemy of the good, and in doing so prevented anything from happening. We've been sitting for three, four years with nothing happening. Downtown's starting to come back, but only slowly. We've done massive harm in how we have approached this, and I don't want to see that happen here. After that, I'll talk about a few potential policy lessons out of this. I don't have answers yet. I've got a few, t I've got a few priors, which means I've got some initial ideas of how things might get fixed, but more importantly, I think that I've got the questions, the things that we should be researching, and a research agenda that I'm hoping to lead here at the initiative over the next couple of years to try and make sure that we figure out how Wellington can set policy so we don't wind up with another Christchurch when it happens here. Because I don't want to go through that again. So, setting the scene. And I guess in a big bit of scene setting, you can just contrast how cities work with how planners work. 
Is anybody familiar with the video game SimCity? It's one of my favorite analogies on this one. I grew up with SimCity. I, uh, I'm 38. When I, in the 90s, I was playing SimCity on an old, um, uh, on an Amiga first, and then on a 486 DX266. All kinds of fun. Windows 3.1. Um, and in SimCity, you're, you're the city planner, and you set out what the ideal city should look like, and you put in, put in some roads, and everybody needs roads, and that's good. And then you set up some zones where you think people should be able to live. Yeah, I think, I think it'd be good for some people to live here, and for businesses to be here, and maybe industry can be over here, and then maybe some higher density buildings here once you get to the higher levels of SimCity or the, the uh, later updates when you can have intense and less, less intense development. The early one is just green and blue and, and yellow. Um, but whenever you hit the pause button, it doesn't matter. You can pause for as long as you like. You can hit save, think about things, come back. You put up a stadium, you don't like where it is, you bulldoze it, you bulldoze some people's houses, you put up a stadium somewhere else. Nobody minds, there's no protests, nobody's affected. I think too many planners grew up playing SimCity and came to it <laughs> from that mindset. Um, and we'll, we'll come to how that isn't much of a stretch in the Christchurch case. Um, Bits on uh, me in particular, I'd moved to Christchurch in November 2003 to take up a job as lecturer at the economics department at the University of Canterbury, then senior lecturer, and we were there through the earthquakes and then came here afterwards. It, Christchurch's downtown was seen as kind of dying uh, when I first moved there in 2003, but it was starting to pick up substantially from 2006 onwards, partially through massive losses accrued by one developer who put up a bunch of really beautiful things but lost his shirt doing it and cost the council a pile of money in the process. But we were seeing some nice development in Christchurch anyways. We were seeing some new innovative bars coming in, some old warehouses turning into loft apartments and innovative retail spaces. Downtown was looking not too bad. Um, we also had a bunch of buildings that were, well, property values were a little lower in parts of downtown along Manchester Street, a few others, where you had some old, um, old brick buildings, well, some of it not unlike what you find in Cuba Street here, parts of Colombo Street going down to Sydenham, buildings not unlike Cuba Street, not with the kind of culture that you've got there, but the same kinds of buildings. But Buildings that were housing tenants that could never ever afford to replace the buildings they were in based on their cash flow. So you had secondhand bookshops and a barber shop. My barber was in there, um, comic book shop, uh, that sort of thing. And they existed because of these legacy buildings, because property values were low and rents were low in the downtown. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that you've got low property prices downtown, unless some innovative stuff happen on lower rents. Christchurch. So in the lead up to the, uh, to the September earthquakes and then going through to February, Christchurch also had a fairly restrictive housing planning environment, not unlike that which obtains in most of the rest of the country. Not that different. We still had fairly high median multiples on housing prices. We had a fairly restrictive urban land uh, boundary where they were not letting too much encroachment out into uh, land on the outskirts of town. And relatively little land was zoned for upzoning uh, within town. You could do it downtown. And only very shortly prior to the earthquakes did they rezone for upzoning near the, near the beach. It was weird. When we moved to Christchurch in 2003, wa we wanted an apartment by the beach and we wanted one in Brighton but they didn't have any. It wasn't zoned for it. Instead, you had really, really trashy houses where the, where the owners were just squatting on them, waiting for council to finally allow somebody to build an apartment building there. So they were letting them just run down to nothing, and you had the kind of tenants that attracts, and then you had the kind of business that can be sustained with the kind of people who live near there. Um, and we chose to end up buying out there anyways afterwards. Um, they finally upzoned, then the recession hit, and then the earthquakes. So it was too late for that to happen. But is more indicative of that there weren't that many places where it was allowed and council was not quick to allow things in places. Now this was hardly unique to Christchurch or to New Zealand. We've had these kinds of restrictions everywhere and there's just been a ton of work being done uh, by the initiative and by others looking at the effects of this kind of really restrictive housing supply practice. In short, it screws poor people and makes housing more expensive than it needs to be. 
So uh, don't think that Bill English has been entirely wrong in saying that it's been exacerbating our poverty problems and child poverty and inequality would be less bad than it is if we were to get after housing cost incomes more in line with what they should be. Now, after the er September earthquake, we started seeing that these regulations might start being a little bit binding. So in s the September earthquake was, it affected the west side of town, it affected some parts of downtown, but it wasn't huge. I'll call it this, this the interquake lull. So we had a bit of a wake up with it, uh, literally, because it was four in the morning and we ran out, I, I ran over to the then two year old's room uh, to make sure that he wasn't getting anything falling on him. And my wife stood beside the uh, several few month old Eleanor's crib and she slept through it. And Sue just stood there beside, rocking like on a boat. It is lovely. Uh, and we started seeing some potential problems in housing supply. Hugh Pavletich, who's always been on this kick of wanting to increase housing supply, reiterated his call for that we should be increasing the supply of land on the city fringes and allowing more development to take place in case of further earthquakes and to make room for the workers who are going to be coming in for even the minor works that needed to be done in the September quake. The September cordons were relatively short. The power stayed on. Uh, water was back on at our place within the day. Uh, unlike in February, we lived out on the east side of town in, in South Brighton. We bought there in 2005, a great place out by the beach. Things were a lot worse downtown and especially out at Darfield, but Christchurch bounced back fairly fast. Um, lots of buildings were closed pending further investigation. Um, but a few things that started looming as potential problems were that uh, heritage buildings were really hard to deal with. And that's one of the things that will worry me here in Wellington, and we'll talk about it a bit later. But we'll just go through what happened in Christchurch first. Um, there was a block of buildings along Colombo Street. This is just one example. There are plenty of these all over the place. Uh, they were a fairly low council heritage designation. They weren't in the Historic Places Trust Register. They had council category four protection, where they had some regional importance rather than national significance. It is sort of two-story brick with a bit of facade on them along Colombo Street. And they, they weren't safe. Um, they went through and the engineers said they needed to be made safe or torn down, similar to some buildings that you have here that we'll go through later. Um, the owner couldn't get permission to tear them down, though. Council wouldn't let him do it. Uh, he went through to see what it would cost to fix up. It would have cost him $200,000. He reported to the later uh, Royal Commission inquiry into the deaths that were caused by his buildings, which we'll go through later. Uh, but we're not there yet. We're still in September and everything's happy. Um, it's going to cost him 200 grand to fix up the facade, and that wouldn't have made the interior of the building safe yet. It would have protected against the masonry falling on passers-by, but it wouldn't have let him use the building. And the repairs that would have been necessary to let him use the building were thoroughly uneconomical, given what kind of rents he can draw from that kind of building. So he'd wanted to bowl it and put up something cheaper, easier to maintain, and attract different tenants. Uh, council said no. They said that uh, they had to follow a minimum six-month consenting process for permission to dem demolish, and they claimed that the RMA forced them to. That, they, that their hands were tied, there were processes that had to be followed, and well, you just have to wait it through and submit all the paperwork and incur all the costs of going through the RMA process. Now, council wasn't entirely right about this. Uh, the council lawyer later asked the owner in testimony, is it your testimony here that we could just flout the RMA? Well, Parliament had already given council authority to supersede all kinds of regulations if necessary to ensure safety. Council did not wish to invoke the powers that were, they were authorized to use. The RM, RMA enabled them to set district plans that were very restrictive. They allowed themselves to be bound by the rules that they made that they could have superseded if they wanted to, but they really didn't want to. So those buildings needed to get torn down and they weren't getting torn down. Meanwhile, the owners of an H1 listed uh, building, an old church, the old Trinity Congregational Church, which became the Octagon Restaurant, beautiful venue, old stone church, and the people who owned it loved heritage buildings. They bought that specifically because of the heritage building and they cared a lot about heritage and they wanted to do right by it. And they'd undergone a really long restoration process on it. They later found out that some prior owners in 1976, when they'd been trying to fix it up, had been banned 
by the heritage people from putting in some earthquake strengthening beams to protect the tower. Because in doing so, they would have had to have taken off the roof. Taking off the roof would have damaged a couple of heritage shutters. And shutters are important. We love shutters. OK, so, they, so those reinforcing girders weren't in there, and they needed to be. Uh, but he had done as best he could. And then a whole pile of stuff went wrong with that building in September. And they had to then do a whole pile of repair work on it. They poured $600,000 of money into it, into their building, to try and fix it up. Um, but the heritage regs were a problem for them. They had to get a retrospective consent for $8,000 for the scaffolding framing that they had to put up to prevent the tower from falling over. Had they not put this up, it would have fallen over in any one of the subsequent aftershocks. But they had to get retrospective consent at reasonably high cost to get permission to save the building that they cared so much about. All right. So that's just continuing with as things were rather than how things will be here or what needs to be done. Just things that are starting to point to potential problems in the, in, in, in the earthquake lull before February. Hmm. And then things uh, got a little worse. All right. I got real lucky. On February 22nd in the morning, I, I had blogged the night before on some uh, issues of the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership and uh, whether we would actually get access to American dairy mar markets or whether they're likely to just screw us like they did to the Canadians on softwood lumber imports after NAFTA. Um, the, I got a phone call that morning at about 10 in the morning from uh, Canterbury Television asking if I could come by their offices for a, a TV interview on the effects of the TPP, and I was supposed to be over there around 1 o'clock. Uh, now, at about 9.30 that morning, uh, if, if you like nothing else about the ACT Party, uh, Peter McCaffrey saved my life here. He had called me up because he he's with ACT on campus, and they were doing a little event on campus, and he wanted to have lunch. And I like Peter. He's a lot of fun. So I said, yeah, let's have lunch. And we had lunch booked for 1 o'clock because I had some other teaching stuff to get prepped for. So I had prior commitments. I couldn't make it out to the CTV building. Otherwise, I'm a little bit of a media whore, and I probably would have been there. Um, so that was good. Um, <laughs> instead, I was getting my coat off the back of my door to go out to meet Peter downstairs when uh, the quake hit. So it was pretty easy for me to sit in the doorway and tweet uh, the single word fuck, which was the only time I've ever tweeted an obscenity. And I'm embarrassed to repeat it um, with a hashtag EQNZ. And then Canadians started going, oh, I guess Christchurch has had another earthquake. Um, so that was on the fifth floor of the Commerce Building. And everything was swaying very nicely. But we had no real clue about how bad things were downtown. We'd had a lot of earth earthquakes in the interval. This was a lot bigger. But it felt a lot more like the Boxing Day earthquake. The Boxing Day one was, all things considered, pretty minor. And on campus in Christchurch, it felt a lot like the Boxing Day quake because it was centered out at the Port Hills, um, rather than close to where I, 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 was, I was in Dennis Dutton's hospice room for the box, Boxing Day one, and it felt more like that one. Um, so we had no clue how bad things were or that anything was off downtown. We had to evacuate the building, and I stupidly obeyed the order to evacuate rather than waiting 10 minutes, grabbing all of my stuff, anticipating that we'd be locked out of it for three months um, and unable to work. but bygones, um, got out to the parking lot and got a text message out to my wife who worked downtown. We tended to commute together. And she, well, I was going to go and pick her up. We had no, no indication of how bad things were downtown because it was hard for, to get text messages through. So start driving from Islam, where campus is, to get to downtown. And everything seems pretty normal in Islam. A couple traffic lights are out here and there, but things are looking pretty normal in Islam trucking along, listening to Radio New Zealand. The only thing they're saying is, oh, we've heard reports that there's been another earthquake in Christchurch. Okay, trucking along. Get up to Hagley Park. And my normal route to pick up Susan, who worked downtown, was to go through Hagley Park and then down uh, the one-way system, uh, Litchfield Street, to, to get out to the east side of town to go home. Uh, the kids were home with my parents who were visiting. So uh, we wanted to get back to them. And I wanted to pick up Susan along the way. I got a note from her after I'd already committed to the downtown route that she'd gotten another ride. But pretty quickly we figured out that things were not well downtown. It was a four and a half hour tra traffic jam to get home. Uh, normally it's about a 25 minute commute from the University to South Brighton. But instead that, night, that day it was four, four and a half hours. Um, 
and some pretty horrible people. Well, the road goes by the air, uh, hospital, everybody carrying people to the hospital, and ambulances trying desperately to get through. There were no reports on the radio when we were heading to downtown, avoid downtown. It could be useful that radio journalists have some inkling of what, that we get notice out to them quickly if there's something like that. Hey, everybody, avoid downtown. Radio New Zealand failed utterly in that one. Um, or at least they failed me. I sh maybe I shouldn't have trusted in them. Um, but we finally got home. The bridge was out at South Brighton and had to park the car on the other side, walk across and diverted around the sewage lakes because of the busted pipes uh, by going around some of the park and got home. Found that power was out, water was out, and the kids had just come down with the flu. Uh, so that wasn't so good. Uh, but all the bridges were out and nobody could tell you what was open. Also, because the power was out on the east side of town, there was no way of fueling up. All of the petrol stations on our side of town were, were not operating. Now, anybody getting from downtown or the east side, or from the west side of town out to the east side of town to get home will be on fumes by the time they get home after a five hour or four and a half hour commute. And none of the gas stations are open, or at least you can't tell what's going to be open because you have no way of knowing. All right, so that was Tuesday. By Thursday, I had reconnoitered with a bicycle and figured out which, how to get out of South Brighton. And then Friday morning, we decamped at about four in the morning, loaded everybody up into the two cars on fumes, both of them, because um, we figured that way there'd be less traffic and we'd be able to get to, out to some place where the petrol stations were working. And one of the first things that I did when I got out there and where I had reliable access to power again, I suggested strongly that everybody triple the petrol prices and do it immediately. Now, why, did the, why is this? We had a market failure. The market failure here was that every single petrol supplier knew that they would be excoriated by right-thinking people if they hiked their prices, because price gouging is bad and evil. Instead, on the east side of town where I lived, and where, well, my neighborhood wasn't too bad, but a lot of the east side of town is very poor. They were all stuck. They couldn't carpool together to get somebody out to where the groceries were working, where you could get groceries because you didn't know whether you're gonna be able to get home. Because everywhere on the west side of town, because of the fuel shortages, everybody who had two SUVs, maybe each on a half tank, they went and filled them both up. Your petrol supplies are not robust to that, and they never can be, right? They only handle enough for normal demand. If everybody all of a sudden wants to have a full tank, they can't handle it. If you double the petrol prices, or had reasonable price gouging, it would have cost more to have fuel, but you would have stopped that. And in effect, it ended up isolating a lot of people on the east side of town who otherwise could have gotten out to get groceries. So we, we can feel good about uh, ourselves in oppo opposing price gouging if we get warm, fuzzy feelings from that, but often we will be doing harm. All right. Uh, on the good side, in Christchurch, uh, in South Brighton, um, they got the water tankers out very quickly. So about a day and a half after the quakes, there was a big tanker of water that showed up outside of the school that you could go and refill your own supplies from. That was pretty helpful. And we learned a lot about community. It was really good. Guy down the street had a sign at the end of his yard saying, I have a generator. If you need to recharge your phone, come and plug in, because he had a power bar hooked to it with a whole pile of chargers coming out. And then a little note saying, I'm almost out of fuel. If you have some petrol, give me some. So I had a little bit in a can for a lawnmower and I, I helped fuel them up and I charged up because that is the only way of finding anything out was to get a little bit of internet off the remnants of battery power on the cell towers because everything else was out. And then we escaped. We decamped for Wigram uh, where a colleague of my wife's uh, family lived and they had moved to Auckland because it, she worked for the ambulance service and the call center in Christchurch shut down, they all moved. Uh, west side of town there was a different world. Lights were all on, the water was working, grocery stores were as normal. It is like, uh, it, it is very different. Um, now, there were some early signs that the things could be decent. So, uh, in Littleton, for example, um, guy, guys who owned cafes were able to restart in their garages. So they'd set up a little, their cappuccino machine there, and they were serving out of garages regardless of health and safety, kinds of food safety requirements. And council would just say, okay, fine, just keep making coffee, keep people sane. And that, that was good. Uh, but uh, there were some early warning signs too. So um, downtown went under military lockdown very quickly. 
And even if you had your own search and rescue technicians that would accompany you into a building, you were forbidden from assuming that risk at your own risk. Okay, so the first excuse for not letting people into their own buildings was that you're imposing risk on others because we would feel compelled to come and rescue you if you got into trouble. Okay, that's not totally crazy. So they say, all right, I've got my own search and rescue team who will be, who will be on the job. No, you're still banned from taking on that risk. That's not the New Zealand I moved into. The New Zealand I moved to is the one that lets you go through cave stream even in the middle of winter, not wearing very much, at risk of hypothermia if you want to. All right? We let people take these risks. It was dumb that we weren't letting people take some of these other risks. It was a strong, it was really harmful for a lot of businesses who couldn't access their records. Uh, at the university, we, we had always been told, keep everything on the network drive. Keep everything on the network drive in case your hard drive goes down. Keep everything on the network drive. Uh-oh. Can't reset the servers with power out, and nobody's allowed into the building. Nice. Couldn't work. A couple months until I think somebody snuck in and got the servers out. But we won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> But we will talk about one that uh, Anthony Goh was talking about in the Christchurch Press just a couple months ago, where he had managed to get around some of these regs. What he had to do, uh, he owned some hotels, and his guests who were in the hotel for the February earthquakes lived all over the world, and they evacuated as quick as they could, but their luggage was left. Anthony couldn't get into his hotel to get the, uh, the luggage, what he, but demolition contractors were allowed. So he got himself listed as a no-pay employee for one of the demolition companies that he had hired <laughs> and then under that authorization went in and got all of his clients' uh, luggage and shipped it back to them around the world at his own expense. He's a hero. Council was not letting him, or civil defense was not letting him get the job done and he got the job done. It wouldn't take no. And that, that counts as a hero for me. Um, other bits of silliness. Campus daycare sends me an email. Even after you're ready to get back to work, you're going to have a hard time doing that if you've got a then, uh, I think, now Ira would have just turned three and Eleanor was about nine months old. Hard to work when you've got a three-year-old and a nine-month-old running around. Um, so the campus daycare email said, quote, I am unsure how long the Ministry of Education will take with approving applications to reopen given the sheer number of applications they'll receive from schools and early childhood services. They'll also need civil defense to lift their current regulation for all such places to remain closed for now. The building was fine. They were able to get an engineer's report saying it was fine. We weren't allowed to use it because some jerk in government said you can't. What the hell? That's dumb. Um, restaurant owner, banned from going into his restaurant to get his stuff, find soldiers sit guarding cordon. They'd been into his restaurant to grab chairs to sit on. <laughs> It was so unsafe he couldn't go in to get his chef's knives, but the soldiers could go in. Sound buildings getting demolished because they're the same color as a bad, badly damaged neighbor and nobody's looking at the paperwork too closely. Um, there's a quote in the paper, every building that was cream in Hereford Street was demolished. Uh, people are forbidden from taking their own risks. Now we talked about, uh, these are kind of funny and another, another funny one, uh, Twitter was good. So there was a hashtag somebody started called EQNZ Pickup Lines and uh, at Zebra said, have you got water? Want to take a shower together anyway? Or Magic Dave says, roses are red, violets are blue, the power is out, there's nothing better to do. Uh, EQNZ Pickup Lines, they're great. Uh, we had a lot of fun that way. And the last one was, you know Ken Ring predict predicted we would meet tonight, give or take five days either side. <laughs> so Ken, Ken Ring was the moon man who was predicting when, when the next earthquake is going to hit based on cycles of the moon. He was mad. Um, less funny, those buildings I talked about before. So, Colombo Street, that's basically what uh, um, Cuba Street's going to look like. Now, old brick facades, nice buildings, thump. Now, here's the one that I was talking about in particular that uh, the, the owner was banned from demolishing because somebody in council thought that heritage mattered more than anything else in the world and they wouldn't use the extraordinary powers that were given them. That's a bus that my friend Ann Brower was on. She was the only survivor on that bus. Because some jackass in council thought that heritage mattered more than anything else. The reinforced masonry facades squished the bus. She managed to get out with some pretty severe injuries and she was in traction for a while and a bunch of rehabilitation. Uh, but she, she, she ended up fine at the end. So those are some of the problems from February. Now the aftermath from February, well, even in the best case, you're going to get buildings falling on buses and on people, and it's terrible because earthquakes are horrible things. 
and there's not a lot you can do about that. You can try and build your regulations that they're, the fewest people will be killed in cost of, at least you won't be having people killed in co where they could have been protected in cost effective ways. That's the best you can hope for in an earthquake. That you're not spending too much money on saving lives, but where you could have saved a life at reasonable expense, you do it. We have to figure out how to get that kind of arrangement in Wellington. The mess that we particularly had was an insistence on planning after the earthquakes. So, what do we get? I call it the plan against the rebuild, because it stopped the rebuild. So, neither the September earthquake nor the February one resulted in any substantial relaxation of the restrictions against uh, house, housing growth, either in density or on the city fringes. City fringes is more plausible after the quakes, and somebody can, there we are. Um, City fringes is more plausible after the earthquakes, but we'll start with the very simplest thing that could have been done. Right, even if council had gotten everything right in terms of allowing new building to take place for housing and allowing apartment buildings to go up where the ground was safe, you still weren't going to be able to get insurance on it because no sane insurer would be would uh, give you building insurance when there's strong risk that everything's just going to fall down again in one of the 8,000 earthquakes that followed the February quake. Okay, your premium is basically going to be the value of your building. So that wasn't going to happen. But what you could do, if you were a homeowner, you were covered for any minor alterations you might make to your house under your existing cover. Wouldn't be hard to put up an internal wall if your house is kind of big. Like my friend John Fountain, my colleague at the Economics Department at Canterbury, he wanted to put up a, a wall inside his house because his house is a little bit bigger than he needed put a separate kitchen in it. We see them all over the place here. Wellington's a little smarter than Christchurch. So there are a lot of places here where you've got a secondary flat that's built into a house, a granny flat, whatever. Uh, but they're let out to other people. It's easy to set these up and it would have worked under the regs in Christchurch or, or at least under the insurance policies. You can, you can do that. The insurer is going to be happy with it because it's a minor alteration. And it's exactly the kind of housing that Christchurch would have needed right after the earthquake because it can get put up real fast. It's small. You can put up workers in it. You can put up displaced people for a short period of time because you can put up with living in a secondary flat for a short period of time where, when your house is getting fixed, whenever your house will get around to being fixed, where you might not want to live in there permanently. And it could start housing some students for the university that were being displaced by construction workers. Instead, it was banned by city council. City council said that you can't do this because it's, well, it might have effects on neighborhood character. We were never able to get any kind of coherent explanation out of them for why they'd continue to ban this. The only thing that I've been, my best understanding of it, which might be the wrong understanding of it, is that people around the university hate students. They are rich, they're in Jerry Brownlee's constituency, they have political power, and anything that allows secondary flats to be built allows more students and it gives risk of having the Dunedin student life near the university, which none of these people who love walking their little dogs on the university campus would ever countenance if it ha had a student next door to them. So regulation remained stuck on the stupid gear. Imagine a transmission, park, reverse, neutral drive, stupid. That's where we were in Christchurch for way too long. Um, that's the simplest thing they could have done. They wouldn't do it. CIRA came up with a rule that would allow it. Now CIRA's rule, here's a great one. If you can guarantee when you put in your consent applications that the, you're going to let it out to somebody who was directly affected by the earthquakes, not a worker coming in temporarily, not a student, somebody who's directly affected. And if you know that a few months ahead of going to market because you're still going to have to build the thing, then you can put in the consent application. But you have to tear it all out by 2018. Would you incur the cost of doing that under that kind of regulation? Hell no. So that it's remained effectively banned. Now, that is a small and stupid thing that would not have substantially eased the problem in Christchurch. It never could have. There aren't that many houses that could that, that'd be five bedroom places where you could carve off a two bedroom apartment. But that they wouldn't even do that is indicative of the mindset that we had there. The planners hunkered down, well, in my view. When, when you're faced with crisis, you stick with what you know. And you just keep, you find comfort in your routines. And that's what they did. Finding the forms, making sure they're stamped, and ticking the boxes. And meanwhile, my neighbor next door had people living in his garage because the planners wouldn't allow him to live better than that. All right, 
So this stuff makes me angry. Um, yes, the plan against the rebuild. So that's part of the housing problem. We didn't, simply didn't get enough housing built quickly. We had 12,000 houses that were knocked out in the red zone, um, thereabouts, and we couldn't build houses to replace them. We had displaced people. We had workers coming in from abroad. Uh, half a campus seemed to be Irish guys in Floro for a while. Um, and we had students that were being displaced by other workers that needed places. Nothing was being allowed to ease up on that. We had a few temporary villages that got set up by council as temporary accommodation, and those were laudable, I'm sure. But wouldn't it have been better to just let people build and ease up the regs a bit to allow it? Um, mess. We we'll continue. We can't blame council entirely for this, though. Sierra's uh, regs were nonsense. And Jerry Brownlee had broad authorizing legislation there where he could have done stuff. They were scared of judicial review. And I think he failed to get anything off his desk to allow the rebuild to happen. Insurance was another problem. EQC and me. Um, as you all know, your private insurance policy has a, an EQC checkoff on it where regardless of the value at risk uh, or the riskiness of your property, you are paying a slight checkoff to EQC that caps out at a fairly low level to give you $100,000 or $120,000 worth of coverage uh, for the first bits of damage to your house. After that, it's on your private insurer. Now that's all well and good, and there's some good reasons for that too. In California, it's pretty hard to get coverage that'll handle natural disasters. Um, what didn't make sense is the, was that EQC took a lead role in assessment and coordination after the earthquake. They were never equipped to do this. The report that they submitted to Parliament shortly before the earthquake said, we cannot handle this job. We do not want this job. Do not give us this job. Now, uh, this is before the earthquakes. And things like, uh, I, I'm not going to fault National on that one. It happened, like, I, the earthquake was only a year or so after the, they got elected. And these things fall very quickly into the big problem, but not immediate problem uh, bucket. It needed to get fixed sometime. And there are other things on the agenda in a global financial crisis. Understandable. Um, but what it led to was a series of problems. The first and most obvious one is they couldn't scale up quickly to assess properties for damage. They did not have the staff for it. They didn't have the expertise for it. They were hiring in people who were thoroughly incompetent to look through houses and tick boxes and say what had happened to them and what kind of repair strategy might be needed. And a whole lot of homeowners, me included, were a little worried that their incentives were all bunged up, that because EQC might not have had quite enough reinsurance, any excess cost falls on the government. And keeping those costs down was pretty important. So we were getting repair strategies that were utterly inconsistent with what we thought we'd signed on for in our insurance policies around um, total, re uh, total reinstatement of the building, for example. Uh, we, we were under cap for EQC purposes, so I can't, bl uh, can't really cl uh, talk about the interface between the private insurer and EQC on this one. Uh, but I don't consider it to be as new standard to have notches cut into my bearers and making the building a little bit less strong than it had been before. Okay, you pay, po you pay a policy based on one understanding of what as new means. EQC doesn't maintain that. Now, some of it is cost maintenance. Some of it, it was incompetent assessors going through. And Again, we can't really fault EQC that much on it. What the hell were they supposed to do when they were given this job, given that they were given that job that they should never have had? We'll come to some potential restructurings later. Uh, the second problem with EQC, the interface with the private insurers. Because the first bit of damage goes on EQC, and then the next bit goes on to the private insurers, there's always opportunity for scraps over apportionment in particular. So EQC's cap goes up to hundred grand. Now that, that per event. Is the series of earthquakes an event or was each one an event? Ended up being that each one was an event, but that gives grounds for litigation. What counts as um, a betterment? Council bunged things up here too when they were say when they changed the regs on how deep uh, piles would have to go and what foundations had to look like after an earthquake. Now there's been some recent uh, decisions come down on this one that me that 
make me pretty skeptical that anybody will ever be able to get full reinstatement insurance again, where, um, well, after the Christchurch quake, council looked out and they said, well, we need to have deeper piles than we did before. So if you're fixing your house, you need to put in deeper piles and change your foundations. And it has to be to a stronger percentage of code. Now, imagine you're an insurer. You had insured this house for reconstruction to the standard that you expected obtained. After the insured event happens, council changes the regs before you've engaged your repair strategy. Your costs are much higher than you thought that you'd been insuring for. <coughs> How can you blame the insurers for being upset about this? It's a cost that council foisted on them. And you got years of litigation in trying to sort it out in which nothing could be done again because council went and did something stupid. In an ideal world, yeah, we want these deeper piles. It's all nice. Maybe we could have had that to only happen five years after the event instead of being announced before people had the repairs in. Um, all of this meant that repairs were delayed. Builders were sitting on their hands. Some building contractors were laying off staff because they couldn't get going. Uh, we'd first talked with our opt-out builder, I believe, in about September 2011. And we had been hoping for repairs in 2012. We didn't end up having repairs start until May 2014. Um, and the house only just finished its repairs when I was moving to Wellington. And it's now on the market, all nicely painted and new. Um, other problem that we've got, well, project management. The government decided that we wanted to have a single project management entity overseeing everybody's repairs instead of letting, in a sane world where you've had, if you had any other damage to your house, right? You get in touch with the insurer, you say, okay, this has happened. You decide on a builder, the builder comes in, fixes it, so long as the insurer is happy with that builder, everything gets done, you have to pay the bill, it's all good. Instead, the default is that you have to go through, flat, through a project management office. And one big outfit doing that is, it's not robust. It builds in fragility again. If something goes wrong, it goes wrong kind of for everybody, or haphazard, depending on which contractor you happen to have gotten out of the project management office. We opted out because we were a little bit nervous about that whole deal. Uh, but they didn't make it easy to opt out, and the paperwork's a kind of a mess. Um, final problem that we might think about, if you're sitting in a house on a cliff side in Red Cliffs that's going to fall off the edge of the cliff and did fall off the edge of the cliff, you're paying the same EQC premium as somebody who's on the soundest land available. I'm not sure that makes sense. It's kind of like charging the same insurance premium to a 16-year-old with a Ferrari as you would to me in an Odyssey. Now, it's true that the premiums will vary because the private insurers are going to be adjusting by value at risk and your overall premium will reflect it. You're still introducing a distortion in the EQC premiums there. Finally, downtown plan. Um, again, we prevented anything from ha uh, I went through EQC. Downtown. First, Council had its share an idea event where everybody had their great ideas about what downtown should look like, encapsulating their greatest visions of the world and what the city should be like and communal and everything happy and nice and wonderful and not paying much attention to any of the wishes or desires of the people who happened to own the land where all this was supposed to happen. So that was the first bit. Then the plan that came out of that was viewed as nonsense and likely rightly so. And so then we were bequeathed the CCDU the Central Christchurch Development Unit. And its job, a year after the first job, was to come up with the new perfect central plan for Christchurch. Okay, so the one central plan was not good enough. We needed another one, and meanwhile, still nobody can do anything downtown. Uh, and businesses are starting to flit out of downtown, sensibly realizing this is all going to take way the hell too long, and it's going to be too hard. So Lincoln Road is picking up. Out near the airport is picking up. Downtown, dead zone. Uh, CCDU. They came up with their perfect plan, which involved a lot of precincts. Now, these are beautiful things, right? Well, let's have, let's have an arts precinct here where all the arts people live and do their arts thing. And people can go there for arts stuff. They like arts. And over here, this is going to be an innovation precinct. OK, now that's a fun one. Um, one, of the, one of the entrepreneurial heroes of the Christchurch rebuild was Will McClellan and his bunch at the Epic Technology Hub. They had a bunch of the Christchurch uh, computing businesses that were displaced by the quakes, decided that they should, they should house themselves in a common spot. He set up a building for it. He somehow managed to get insurance for it, got it all set up, and they had a shell built and were renting out the tenants. Then somebody decided, let's put an innovation precinct around there. 
OK, once you do that, you inflate the value of the land because uh, that's the spot for it. Now, all of a sudden, they can't afford to do phase two and phase three that they were planning. And they're threatening to leave for Sydenham and other places. I'm not quite sure what happened between them and the government afterwards, but they, they did end up staying. And uh, they wrote a more laudable chapter in the uh, book that I've got a chapter in than the first draft that I'd heard about. So I don't know what quite happened in the interval there, but it's all happy now, uh, but for that, the artificial inflation of land values. Um, arts precincts. Hotel owner in the arts precinct wanted to rebuild his hotel. The insurer was ready. He said, yeah, it's a write-off, rebuild. Land was fine. But we didn't quite know whether it was consistent with the vision for an arts precinct to have a hotel there. <laughs> this was day like 734 after the earthquakes. Guy wants to rebuild his darn hotel, and some pencil pusher can't decide whether he's allowed to yet because he doesn't know whether that's consistent with an arts precinct. So that's sort of the top-down Sim City view of how you handle reconstruction. Nobody minds if you hit pause for 734 days and counting. <laughs> we can keep doing that. Nobody's hopes and dreams are crushed by that. Nobody's plans are wrecked. We'll get the perfect city. It'll all be fine, except that everybody's leaving out to the outskirts. Downtown. Um, the last bit, they decided that it was a policy. Of good cities, successful cities, have high housing prices that, because that reflects that people want to live there. Therefore, somebody decided in Treasury, we should make sure that, housing pri that uh, land prices are high because that's a signal of a thriving city. Let's buy up all the land around the downtown and make a ring, a green zone. Will induce artificial land scarcity so that land's more expensive. It was already a dicey proposition about whether you want to rebuild downtown or not, given all the uncertainty with the precincts and the zones and whether you'd be allowed to do anything. Then some bright spark goes and makes the land way crazy expensive. All right. So this is just what's, what happened in Christchurch. I've got a few policy lessons and a research agenda that I'm hoping to be able to engage with here. I don't have answers yet. I don't, uh, I've got some initial thoughts about an answer or ways towards answers or at least things that we should be avoiding. Uh, but I've got questions. So first off in this EQC restructuring. I think it's nonsense that EQC was ever asked to lead this. I think they should never be allowed to lead such a thing again. Might it make far more sense that EQC only plays the role as a co-insurer, basically, where you only ever, if you're an insured party, you deal with your private insurance company. Your private insurance company reports the damage to EQC and gets a check from EQC for the amount, and you deal with your insurer for any of the repair strategy. And if you're mad at your insurer, then the reputational losses accrue to your insurer. There are global reinsurers that have provision to be able to get more assessment professionals out. You can choose to buy a policy from a company that has provision for such things, if you want, so that you get assessed quickly. And then EQC would just be reduced to writing checks and doing spot audits afterwards to make sure there aren't giveaways. We had a bit of a sense after the September earthquakes that there was a bit of a giveaway going on and maybe that is being used as fiscal stimulus. Nothing could be ever proven, but people were getting their houses entirely repainted for just a few cracks after September because uh, that is mostly being covered out of uh, reinsurance and uh, there wanted to be, people wanted there to be spending anyways and um, there didn't seem to be a budget constraint. That all reversed after February uh, and things got a lot tighter. The spot audits would stop the private insurers from giving, providing their clients with giveaways on the taxpayer or EQC dime. And we might even think about risk assessing the EQC premiums. It might not be crazy. A second thing we might think about, this is something that worries me a lot. We risk overreacting on some of the earthquake risk. Uh, earthquake stuff terrifies the hell out of me. I look at the Harcourts building out here. I talked about problems with heritage. I'll come to, again to heritage. That building scares the living bejesus out of me. Um, we might think about market failures that are induced where ACC absolves building owners or anybody of personal liability if they kill somebody or for damages caused by their building. We do not 
Prut insurance uh, assessments on based on the risk that's imposed to passers-by. And you've got, in some cases, lengthy time horizons for making buildings safe in Wellington. Or at least we don't know whether it's the right time horizon, right? You could say 10 years for things that are less, more, uh, more risky, 30 years for things that are less risky, but it's pretty hard to tell. Another approach that we could use, and I'm keen to investigate whether it could work, I'm, all, I'm not sure if it would or not, but it's, it's worth looking at. Imagine that instead, if you own a building and your building falls on people, and the Ministry of Transport says that the value of a statistical life in New Zealand is $4.2 million for policy purposes, you're liable for $4.2 million for every person your building kills. And you must have insurance coverage sufficient to pay out for every person your building kills. Now, all of a sudden, we've got, okay, we've got a new insurance market where you're having to buy that kind of liability policy. Maybe you could route it through ACC if you wanted, but I'm less confident that they'd be able to do the risk assessment. You could have a specific carve out from ACC for that kind of policy otherwise. Um, then, if your building is in the middle of nowhere and is going to fall over, your insurance premium is zero because it will kill zero passersby. If your building is downtown here and is going to fall over, on all the passers-by, and there are a lot of passers-by because it's Lambton Key or something, your insurance premium is going to be higher. Now, it might not be all that high because we've got like a 1% risk of quake every year, something like on that order. Um, but at least we will then internalize the risk, encourage that efficient strengthenings be undertaken, and avoid over-strengthening in places like Amaru, where you're going to kill just a bunch of beautiful buildings if you mandate that they be made quake safe for Wellington standard. Different standards should apply based on how, how many people are around. So saving lives is important, but it's not the only goal. And we need to be weighing these up. And the last one that we need to look at is heritage protection and how we deal with that. It was a substantial cost in Christchurch that we killed a lot of people based on how we deal with heritage. Now it's I love seeing heritage buildings. I think that there is a real case for maintaining them. I think that private owners have great incentive to maintain them, but there can also be some case for public funding to make sure that uh, any spillover benefits are internalized. But right now, buildings can get he a heritage designation fairly easily. Or you get, uh, there's 600 and some buildings in Wellington that have earthquake or that have heritage designation, and something like 20% are. Uh, 20% uh, of the earthquake prone units are heritage listed, uh, around 133. 133 earthquake prone buildings in Wellington that are very, very difficult to repair because of how we handle heritage regulation. That's kind of scary. We might think about alternative ways of handling heritage. One of them might be that we just stop protecting heritage through regulation and instead purchase annual easements from those people who are providing through their buildings a heritage amenity. What that does is two things. First, it gives you a positive incentive to maintain your building because you're getting paid to provide that amenity. Second, it forces a bit of a budget constraint on councils in thinking about heritage buildings. I know Wellington's ahead of the ball on this and they're thinking about restricting the number of, of registered buildings. You've got sort of layers of stupid that can happen where the RMA um, enables a very strict level, or Heritage amenities are in section six, and then the economic stuff is in section seven. So if the district plan says, gives heritage protection to certain buildings, that comes under section six protection, as I understand things, and that gets priority. Although there's been uh, the high court punting some, the, the Harcourt's building back to the environment court. What happened there? The Harcourt's building, like the one on Colombo Street that I was talking about earlier, was simultaneously required to be demolished by Building Act requirements because it is unsafe. and forbidden from being demolished by the RMA uh, and the district plan that puts heritage designation on it. So if we instead said, bull, if, say, you can tear down any heritage building you want, but if you don't tear this one down, we're going to pay you this much a year for maintaining that amenity because we care about it. Let anybody who cares about heritage put money into that fund, get matching funds out of Wellington Council or the, whatever the local council is and the federal government. It forces a hard budget constraint and some hard decisions about which buildings are really worth protecting with real money out of the, ta out of the tax purse instead of somebody else's money on a regulatory budget. We concentrate protection on buildings that are worth it and we make sure they're funded adequately and we'll let the other ones go by the wayside. And really, we, how, how many buildings in a country that's got maybe 200 years worth of buildings in it? Come on. Um, 
I, I, love, I love the heritage amenity, and I, I put some money into that kind of fund. I care about it, but uh, I care more about not being worried that these kinds of things are going to fall over on me because somebody decided that a two-story building that's brick facade is that much more important than me not being squished. So we need to th rethink heritage protection. And finally, we need to have what I'd consider a few just um, levers that should happen automatically in the case of a major event like a Canterbury earthquake. I don't think that the, plan the planners or the bureaus can be expected to, in the middle of a crisis, change all the regs to make things sane again. I think we need to think it through ahead of time and have a button that gets pushed automatically in the case of an earthquake saying, you know what, we've had an earthquake, all of a sudden, um, well, we cared a lot about maybe neighborhood character in this area and we, so we didn't want to have townhouses going up there or something. That matters less than people living in garages after an earthquake. You push the button, because of the earthquake, you can go to any density you like for three years, four years. Just automatic triggers so that people aren't stuck living in cars and garages because we can't change the rules quickly enough otherwise. Land that gets automatically released for more development. We should be thinking about where that should happen and designate it ahead of time so that it can happen when we're going to be thinking about other things. And I'm hoping that we can come up with some sensible, uh, th those are some my priors about what the answers are. I, they're, they're weak priors. I don't know that they're the right answers, but I think that I've got the right questions. Uh, and I'm going to be drawing on the expertise of at least some of you in the room that I've started talking with about some of these kinds of issues as we go through the next year and I start investigating these a little more fully with the team here. And hopefully we will then uh, be able to have some constructive input into making things a little better uh, when Wellington gets hit. I, I don't want that again. Thank you. Questions? I know there are two very different uh, cities. Yep. Uh, Yep. Um, I don't know enough about the Napier quakes. I know that it was a far smaller group of people who were authorized to make decisions and that they were authorized to make decisions and they just got her done. And that you didn't have massive, huge planning sessions where you'd have 36 people around a round table trying to decide on what the perfect plan is. Uh, so that would be one start. Um, but I think the better answer is to put more priority on the wishes of people who own the land to start with and what they want to see done with it. So in Christchurch, instead of coming up with innovation precincts or big plans, there are, lot, there are lots of inefficiencies with some of the small land holdings that you could have imagined that you get efficiencies if you'd be able to accumulate the land. There are things government could have done in that. Have a better land titles registry where it'd be real quick to find out the exact contact details and the cell phone number of everybody who owns land in town so that you can get in touch with them to try and accumulate land quickly, make offers on it. They could have facilitated things like dominant assurance contracts. Has anybody here heard of a dominant assurance contract before? Okay, yeah, nobody knows about it. So this is another way of handling land accumulation in this kind of case, and it's something that government could have been encouraging rather than just expropriating. So what, how that works is say that you need a large enough section of land to do something cool. You need a, a big accumulation of land, but you're worried about holdout problems because if somebody knows that they are the holdout, they can try and expropriate the whole value of the project by ramping up the costs. Dominant assurance contracts, you buy options on a number of sites. So maybe this footprint could work, this footprint could work, this footprint could work. Buy options on all three. Selling the option, it, okay, I don't know if I'm going to be the holdout or not because I don't know which of the projects they're going to try. But I know that if I sell them the option now for a decent price on the land, I've got cash in my pocket. I have a dominant incentive to take the option so long as the price on execution is fair rather than trying to be the holdout. Promoting that kind of thing instead of these big plans for these big retail precincts saying, oh, okay, well, you can't have any plan that's less than like three hectares or some darn thing. It wasn't that big, but they, they were wanting some very large minimum sizes. Have you got examples of where that dominant insurance contract would work? Alex Tabrock wrote about them. They haven't been used so much yet. He was encouraging their use for uh, roading. I think that those get a little harder because then you've only got so many paths that can go from A to B. Um, 
we did see them one good use of them. They weren't called dominant assurance contracts, but they were option contracts. Where I grew up, there were um, Manitoba Hydro wanted to set up a bunch of wind turbines. And they had a number of sites that would be good because of the wind characteristics. And you want to run these things together because that facilitates maintenance and putting the lines through. So what they did is they bought options from a bunch of farmers saying, we don't know where we want to build. And we haven't even scouted out all the wind characteristics yet. But we want to buy from you now the option to put up these wind turbines if we decide that your site is a good one. We're not going to tell you now whether your site's a good one, but we're buying the option. And everybody sold the option, and you got a whole pile of lines of wind turbines put up near St. Lee in Manitoba. Yes? The Heritage Act was um, significantly amended in the last 12 months. Do you know if that um, amendment addressed any of your concerns about how Heritage is managed in New Zealand? If it had been, we wouldn't have problems with the Harcourts building. It made it worse. Stephen will know more about it than I do. We need a regulatory budget or a budget constraint. Do I have time for one or two more? One more. <laughs> you, you described uh, what you consider regulatory problems. To yep. me, they sound more like cultural problems. In other words, if you've got the wrong... Uh, Regul even if you have the right regulations, if you have a bureaucratic mentality that, that doesn't react to yep. the situation properly, yep. what do you propose to, to change that? Sure. Because it seems to me that I'll many I've got a good answer on that one. realize New Zealand has become unbelievably bureaucratic for a small country. Uh, I can address that for local government, maybe less on central. On local government, it's... Well, Oliver's been leading just a ton of work here uh, on housing. And we the problem that we've identified with housing supply here, it's mostly that councils don't see much uh, return from allowing more building. They get a lot of complaining from NIMBYs and a lot of grief, and they get some infrastructure costs, but they don't see much in, in terms of increased revenue. If you incentivize council to allow building so that they saw some monetary return from having more residents and more economic activity and more businesses and more industry in their jurisdiction, if they got some cut of the tax revenue that comes out of it, they would have strong incentives to fix their bureaus so that they would allow more building. And that would go a long way to build in that kind of robustness. It wouldn't just build in robustness to pro uh, population changes where more people move in, you get more, more housing built. It builds in robustness to big things like earthquakes where you've got this mentality set up that we're going to allow building, we're going to facilitate it, we're going to encourage it. Yeah. It all works together. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think you um, can see why we're so keen to hire Eric to lead our research team. Um, we're glad to have you here. We think that there are lots of lessons to be learned, and it really links in nicely to um, our research plan at the initiative. So would you please join me in thanking Eric Crampton. Thank you.